All right, welcome, welcome to World Unity Week to Room One. My name is Ben Bowler from Unity Earth, and I'm so excited to be here on day four, uh, day four of World Unity Week and day four of the 99 Days of Peace for Unity. It's been an amazing, amazing few days so far, and we're just getting warmed up. We are kicking off with an amazing program today, a beautiful uh, offering called You Awake, Mastering the Art of Change with two extraordinary change makers and visionaries of Hope Fitzgerald and Gary Melkin. Let me start with uh, you, brother Gary. I'll do some quick introductions and we'll get into this. Gary is a multiple Emmy award-winning composer, producer, public speaker, performer and artistic director for conferences and events. Gary is dedicated to demonstrating potent ways in which music and immersive media can serve a vital role towards deepening the integration of our emotional, spiritual, and somatic dimensions of human intelligence. Gary is a member of, uh, in good standing, in both the Association of Transformational Leaders and the Evolutionary Leaders Circle, uh, frequently uh, on webinars, podcasts, talk shows. He's all over with these incredible offerings, and Gary's constantly sharing his humanizing musical solutions for many of the challenges facing our world today. Uh, as he harnesses the transformative capacity of inspirational music and media to enrich every stage of our lives. Gary, brother, welcome back I'm to so World Unity Week. Woo! Room one, <laughs> World Unity Week 2023. Fabulous. Thank you, Ben, so much. How awesome. And Hope Fitzgerald, it's great to have you with us in 2010 after years of spiritual exploration. Hope received three visions representing an evolutionary push for the planet. The final one was a standing figure eight made of flowing water called the infinity wave. Wow, this 10th dimensional energetic tool was sent to more, uh, to more quickly and easily transform suffering into freedom during the tumultuous times that, that uh, are upon us. Ever since, Hope has dedicated a life to applying the infinity wave for the positive development of the individual, the community, and the earth. She's shows continuing to fulfill her mission to encourage planet the globe. Additionally, Hope uses intuitive dowsing to help people quickly gain clarity in their lives and guides groups on transformative journeys around the world. It is so great to have the both of you here and I know this program is just going to be amazing. So Hope Fitzgerald, welcome. Welcome to you and over to you and Gary. Thank you, Ben. All right. Well, I guess we'll just jump right in, should we? Yeah, let's go. All right. It's uh, early morning for some of you on the West Coast. And so let's just take a moment here and uh, close our eyes and just breathe into this beautiful day. And I like to breathe up from the earth into the heart center, just exhaling out whatever cobwebs might be there and inhaling back into the heart. Some of that beautiful Gaia energy and then opening up from the crown, just exhaling up and out like a fountain and inhaling back into the heart center, that beautiful energy from the cosmos. And just bringing us into this present moment in the heart, we are gonna take you on a journey today. We're going to be diving into some areas that might even feel a little uncomfortable at times, but here's what I want you to know. And Gary and I have created something that will bring you back into a bouncy step at the end of the program. This is just a sample of what we have put together. So welcome to you, welcome to us, welcome to World Unity Week, welcome to this beautiful planet and what the great future holds for us. All right, well, <clears throat> let's begin with the first slide. Actually, the next slide. Thank you. So when we are contemplating the new earth, it's radically different, right, from what we're sitting in right now. And even beyond our imagination. So this kind of fanciful picture really caught my eye because I actually was uh, so lucky to be taken to a vision of the new earth last year um, by a certain guides that I have been working with, channeling with. 
and they took my entire group to the new earth. And what I can tell you is that when we emerged onto what seemed like a new planet, but it was really our planet, everything was vividly green. The most important thing was that everything was in communication with us. So the kinds of communication we can do now with trees and rivers and rocks and all kinds of natural forms was immediately available and conscious. And it was teeming with energy and absolutely lush. It was the most beautiful feeling of oneness. So that is really in harmony with Gary's vision of the new earth. I just want to say, first of all, that I am so uh, yeah. <clears throat> pleased to be here. I've been dreaming this in for a long time. So the slide that we have here there is just, we don't need to clarify what uh, we're living in right now, but in particular, there's a perfect storm we're actually dealing with, which is living in a world that is avoidant of the uh, loss the grief, the end of life, the death, as part of the cycle of life. And that's one of the things we're going to focus on. And uh, so we're in a perfect storm. And uh, just just a little one statistic, 90% of all violence of every kind can be attributed to, un to unaddressed loss. So if we're living in a perfect storm that focuses on all the positive, all the growth, all the young, and not actually the cycle, we're in deep do do. <laughs> we're in deep problems. So, uh, so this is what a lot of what we're going to focus on is how can we integrate this all? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. So basically, the worst kind of grief is this. Uh, uh, basically, the worst kind of grief is the kind that gets lodged inside of us, unbeknownst to us. And that's what I just said, 90, 90, over 90% 90 of all violent acts and D and words and aberrations between human beings can be attributed to unaddressed grief. So where does this stuff go and how can we release it and how can we transform it? How can we transmute it, right? So this is something that we want to pay attention to. Next slide. And I just love, go ahead, uh, well, this, this, Francis Weller's work is some of the most extraordinary work because one of the things that he talks about, just look at this quote for a minute. When our grief cannot be spoken, oh, go back, please, go back to the slide. When our grief cannot be spoken, it falls into the shadow and re-arises in us as symptoms. And we all know this, right? But it's important to really pay attention to the nuance of this. And I just want to give a shout out to Francis Weller, who really, his work has really been the kingpin in understanding that grief can only be properly addressed in the context of community, which is one of the reasons why I was so thrilled that Ben accepted our, our uh, request to do something in the World Unity Week this week, because it's integral to what a new earth looks like. New slide. So we'll talk about this in a moment, but I, I want to kind of set it up because when we're talking about the new earth, you know, as enticing as it is and how much we want to leap right to that new reality, we believe that we need to have closure with the old one first. And, and so for each of us individually and collectively, there is a, uh, a kind of an adjustment that needs to be made. We need to be able to have this closure. You know, I think it was Steve Farrell many years ago, I, I read something he said, everybody wants to be enlightened, but nobody wants to change. And I just love that quote because change is not that easy. And our, our workshop is called You Awake, Mastering the Art of Change. And this is the kind of change we're talking about. We change is really evolution, and it involves boldly facing this, our losses, our, our parent, our, our known grief, and as Gary was saying, our hidden grief, and even our, our finishing point of being present on this planet. As we make move through this closure, we make room 
for the new thing. And this is why we're doing this work. We want to be spacious. We want to welcome in the new earth and everything vibrationally, the vibrational coherence, as Gary says, that it is offering us. So most of us would rather not go down that kind of path because we're, we're so much happier dancing around in the unity and the love and the joy, which is absolutely fantastic. And we'll get back to that. But really figuring out how to process this unacknowledged grief, it just binds us up. It keeps us really in a kind of cage and not being able to be our full selves, our free selves. So we're talking about in this workshop, offering a clean break. Uh, and, and it's true, you don't necessarily get through these things in one shot. It may take repeated uh, attempts. But that's really what we're on about here. And the more that we prepare ourselves and open a dialogue in this direction, the better off we'll be for if and when that time of our personal grief arrives. So when we talk about the stages of grief, you know, it's it's it has been written by the beautiful Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, this kind of five-stage process, but very often that's not exactly how it lines up. I think it's really fascinating that we, as soon as we love, we open the door to potential grief, right? If they go hand in hand, and we know so much about what to do with our love, we, we it's very external. We're dancing about it. We're singing about it. It's you know, it's it's ever present. But what do we do with our grief? There aren't really many roadmaps about it. There are more now than there used to be, but still. It would be great, and that's why we put this together. It would be great to have a little bit of a of a guide about how to deal with grief. Grief is not outwardly focused. It's usually an inward journey, right? It's our cave time. It's the yin to the yang of love. And we just want to get through it as quickly as possible because it doesn't feel good. But, you know, would we rush love? No, no. We want to languish as long as we can. In, in terms of grieving, though, that's a societal no-no. Our culture is not set up to handle grieving well, as we've learned over the last few years. And my suspicion is that's because we're very uncomfortable with it. We'd rather not touch our own grief. But the funny thing is that grief brings us together as a community, even as much, maybe even more than love does. So in these stages of grief, each loss can, especially an acknowledged grief, each loss kind of stacks upon the old grief. And sometimes it all happens all at once. And sometimes we end up going numb. Next slide, please. And really what it comes down to is there are only two stages of grief who you were before and who you are after. And this is never to minimize anybody's individual experience. It is highly individual. So we honor, uh, of course, anybody's journey with this. Next slide, please. So, you know, there are some symptoms of grief. Um, and some of them are obvious, you know, we want to isolate, we are, um, maybe overreactive to the emotional situations. Maybe we were at a 10 instead of maybe a three. Um, but I have a list here that that uh, I think is really appropriate because we don't think of people who are really confused or losing their stuff or or get kind of disoriented. We don't think of them as as grieving. We think of them as being confused. But it's good for us to, you know, just go that extra step to understand that that exhaustion, sleep changes, appetite, nightmares, crying, isolation, restlessness, aches and pains, anxiety attacks, even breathing, having panic attacks. These are all symptoms of grief. Next slide, please. And what you notice is all these symptoms are very much a signs of kind of the opposite of being awake. Right? And this is one of the reasons, you know, just recently, I do want to acknowledge the, 
the, the, de the sudden death over a three-day period out of the blue of my beloved friend, Neil Rogan, one of my closest friends in the world, uh, the director, writer, participator in creating a better world since the 70s. And when I, it hit, I, I'm so grateful that music has kept my heart alive with feeling because I felt like I was literally attacked. I just started to howl with grief. And it was just unbearable to think that he wasn't going to be in this world. But what, what is the next? Can you show the side, next side, slide, please? The, but what is it that actually makes it create more suffering? So one of the things that we really could look at right now, and this is one of the reasons we'll talk a little bit later about why music and media and the things that awaken our emotional range are a very important role, have a very important role to play in actually giving a little bit of WD-40 to the subtle ways in which our resistance lives. What if our resistance to grief and loss and death and the end of life and the things that, ouch, that hurt, becomes more of a cause of the suffering so we can actually open our reaction as much as it hurts. Remember when I heard the news about Neil, I, it was unbearable and I just had to let it go and I sobbed. It's not easy, it's hard to do that, but I've been practicing my whole life. The music has helped me a lot with that actually. Um, music has helped me feel my life rather than just think it only. Next slide, please. So, we're really, this is basically a picture of especially COVID, since COVID. I never, I, I often thought about COVID, uh, I mean, about the noosphere. This is the phrase that Barbara Marx Hubbard talked about, where the accumulated dreams and grievances of the planet start to accumulate. And I just had this imagination that there was more accumulated unattended grief that was happening around us than ever before. And we were swimming in it and having the space to process it to some degree, but it was almost unbearable, right? So what is this opportunity that we have now, knowing that it's gotten so big? Next slide, please. Here we go. Go ahead, Hope. Well, reframing grief as an initiation is really what we have come to as uh, the proper honoring of grief. You know, it doesn't necessarily make it any easier, but when we understand that it's a process to be gone through that as in that earlier slide will change us and has the potential to change us for the better. This is, this is what is so remarkable. There are opportunities in grief. And look, every single person on this call or whoever will listen to this has been through grief. We've all been through it to differing degrees. Some are harder than others. But when we come through it, and we do often, we know that we have been stretched and widened in ways that no other circumstance could have done for us. Next slide, please. So we're thinking of grief sort of as a, an alchemical process. And it can feel like this deep, bottomless lake. And, and what we want to try to do is to imagine that lake is the subconscious. What if we were to allow ourselves into that water? What if we could coax the subconscious to open up in a safe space? I'm always reminded of the mythology of Persephone, who did not want to go down into the underworld, but she had to go. And though she was very unhappy about it, when she got there, she started to uh, change the furniture around. She started to allow her presence and her being to affect what the underworld was like. And eventually, became the queen of the underworld and ruled and when in a beautiful way, in a loving way. And when she emerged back on the surface of the planet, she was completely different. She was empowered. So these are some of the opportunities that lie for us in the grief process, even though we don't know necessarily while we're in it that that's what might uh, happen. But these myths are there for a reason. They're to support us and let us know there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it is our transformation. 
Next slide, please. So here's the crux of the matter. When in my work, I have often met people who are in the, a cycle of grief, an endless cycle of suffering, and they go around and around, and there's a lot of rumination. And something I learned recently is that ruminating, especially going into the shoulda, woulda, couldas of whatever that relationship was, is actually a way to stay connected to the person and not let them go. I thought, wow, wow, think of how often we do that. We, we're, it's really a device to keep us connected still. And Hope, it's so I, important. I love, I, I love that you define that because that is so under the radar in so many ways, you know? When, when you're, yeah. and I think something recently happened in a workshop that we co presented at right before we we're about to present. I got hit with something that was so triggering and I got the opportunity to see right before we were presenting this content that I was circling and I was didn't know that the circling was a way to stay familiar with the old part that was triggered because it felt unresolved. So it's such a contradiction. You're drawn subliminally to the old you that was hurt and you want to stay connected to it because it's an impulse that thinks that will be better when you stay. But what it does is put you in a cycle that doesn't have you moving. You're in a vicious cycle. It's such an elusive and insidious habit. That's how to yes. insert that because I know it. No, Gary, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's so fresh still, right? Um, but let's think about what might be besides staying attached to a person if they've departed your life, whether in this life or, or on to the next, what else might keep us in this endless cycle of suffering? Um, well, blame, guilt, remorse, anger, resentment, disappointment from unmet expectations, fear, and attachment to the story of their presence in our lives. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of things that might need clearing out individually, you know, individual attention to each one of those. This is why it's not necessarily a one-off in, in, uh, in what the work is here. So what is the next level? What next slide, please. What could be, ah, what if we take that circle, that cycle, and we just start to move it into a spiral so it has movement so it's going somewhere i i am very interested in movement and you'll hear about that later now this is not necessarily a panacea for everything for but it is a great visual to keep in mind how can i get myself out of that endless endless cycle of suffering and that is what we are going to be presenting in our workshop next slide please So this is one of the things that's so uh, compelling about this is that the fundamental, if that slide is staying up, please, I don't know, maybe I'm seeing it. No, go back to the previous slide. Thank you. The fundamental reframe is that because, you know, 5,000 years ago, the, the, the Bhagavad Gita said, what, please go back and stay on that slide. Maybe it's on, on automatic. So maybe we'll just forget the slides if they're moving until we go back to this. But here it's saying ring the bells that still can ring. There is no perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the, the light gets in. Bhagavad Gita said, what is the most remarkable thing in all the world? And 5,000 year text says the most remarkable thing in the world is that everyone will die, but no one never thinks it will happen to them. So here we are at a moment in history where the fundamental belief in our reductionist, mechanistic, everything separate reality has to do with looking at the wound as a problem to solve, as a crack to fill, as a symptom to remove. But what if, and especially the reductionist healthcare, I see Kathy Douglas is on our, on our call, and I'm so grateful to have you here, Kathy. It's, uh, she's done a massive amount of work in healing this reductionist view of humanity, especially in healthcare. And what if we actually reframed our understanding of the wound as an invitation into letting the light come in, as an opening to our, mortal, uh, to our humanity? And this is one of the reasons why I'm so involved in this, because I believe that music has a destiny to fulfill that I'll talk about a little further, that actually will assist us in restoring 
our ability to feel grief and other things as an essential a tool in approaching the wound as a portal rather than a symptom to be removed. That makes sense. I hope it does to all of you. Yeah, great. Next slide. Thank you. You can go to the one past the Leonard Cohen quote if you can. Right. Next one after this. Hubcast Media doing great job for us. We love you guys. Uh, so this is this thing. When this and heart math came into the world, I suddenly took a huge, deep breath of relief because up until HeartMath's creation and up until Brene Brown's work, I felt like such a odd duck. Uh, and I, now my new phrase is the new woo-woo is wow because I was Mr. Woo-woo for so long, especially when we came up with Graceful Passages, which is the work that put me on the map in terms of health and healing and consciousness with Michael and Doris Stillwater when we came out with the work Check it out if you don't know about it, Graceful Passages. But when Brene Brown started talking as a social researcher about vulnerability being the ultimate expression of our courage and our integrity, and she says that it's the, the birthplace of love and belonging and our connection to authenticity, I suddenly felt like, hallelujah, someone is speaking the language that will now appeal to the American maverick independent mind and think, this is the complete turnaround we've been looking for. Vulnerability, our ability to feel and be honest and authentic and true and real, turns out to be one of the greatest attributes for becoming the best version of yourself. And what is one of the greatest tools for being emotionally vulnerable and healing that? Stay tuned. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> so... Yeah. Well, I want to pose the question with the next slide, and that is, what if grief happens for us and not to us? And that's a little hard to swallow sometimes. If we could go to the next slide. There it is. You know, what if we could turn into our grief and actually embrace it, much like Gary mentioned earlier when his dear friend Neil died just last week? Okay, so that would mean, all right, you know, okay, if this is some kind of gift, what kind of gift might it be? Well, one thing is that grief brings us fully into the present. Anybody who's had a difficult diagnosis can know that their the clarity that they receive in those in that diagnosis is uh, unbelievable. Like all of a sudden, it's very obvious what is and isn't important in life, and how you want to spend your time and your energy and your love. So it brings us fully into the present, into the heart. We get to know what our heart wants. It might reveal the unloved parts of ourselves in that clarity. Wow, this part is really hanging out there and needs some love, needs some TLC. It also is an opportunity to become empowered and not victimized. And that's a hard one for people because we do often feel this just happened to me and I don't know how to get around it. But grief can also open the window, as I said, in this clarity to truth. And the beautiful thing about truth is that that's when healing can occur. It's really, it can, you can have a moment where, you know what, I, this relationship with this person is not good enough. I, uh, there's some pain there and I really want to heal it. And that's a truth. And then you take an action and do it. And that, that, you know, this facing this thing can put us on a path of healing like that. I like to think of it also as moving on versus moving forward. Now, moving on, this is from Susan Cain. Moving on is basically putting it behind me and just, okay, I'm just going to separate. We don't want to do that. We're talking about oneness. We're talking about wholeness here. We want to integrate, integrate these things and move forward with them as a changed person. And in that sense, I like to think of it as always asking for the nugget of truth to be revealed, using that power of emotion to crack us open to find out where and what needs to be healed, where the nugget is. 
this is a really a, a lesson in acceptance and welcoming the changes in curiosity. Next slide, please. So, so again, we want to reference. Want to reference. What am I hearing here? Okay, there we go. Again, I want to reference. What does this have to do with the new earth, right? Well, this is where the arts come in as an important partner in us awakening to the nuance of coherence at every scale, right? So the healing power of beauty. I love John O'Donoghue's work. He's my patron saint. God can't stand that he left this earth so soon, but. When you look at the power of beauty, what he, John O'Donoghue calls the silent embrace, what, what this has to do with the new earth is that at, it, when Held just said that it happens in this context of uh, truth, and it also happens in the context of intimacy and tenderness, right? What could be more intimate and tender than to become aware of your interstitial fluid and your mitochondria cymatically aligning like the sand in those cymatic exercises to sacred geometry of beauty? What is it that you actually can see beauty forming in music affecting either visual or liquid or sand or whatever? That's our bodies. So let's go to the next slide. And this is the thing that's so beautiful is music. So just let these words and what music wash over you. As the slides move, just soak in the music. You can move the slide. Notice how the music slows you down. When we connect with life throughout the heart, through the heart, even the most challenging obstacles can melt away. Let the music continue as the slides move forward. Okay, go back. <laughs> go back, thank you. So let the music finish out. Take a deep breath as the music soaks into your cells. Somehow our relationship to space changes when the music gives us permission to feel as only music can. And this is one of the great secrets and mysteries of music itself. And notice how it ends, the way a life ends. We show it presence, listen. And then when it ends, you let the moment, what is the fruit of the practice? A spaciousness with beginnings and endings is a key gift of music and a beautiful metaphor for how we practice the art of expanding our emotional range as a catalyst for improving and broadening our ability to be a human being. Next slide. Next slide, please. There we go. So we have combined Gary and my work. Uh, it was an experiment. Uh, now we've done it a few times, done this workshop a few times, and it seems to work beautifully together. The infinity wave is something, as Ben said, that came to me in a series of visions back in 2010 as a tool for navigating difficult times, which we, we can all admit that we're probably in and have been in for a little while now. It is, a, it was told to me, uh, a 10th dimensional energetic. It's represented by this figure eight made of flowing water. And water is an incredibly important component. Uh, it's not made of anything else. It's, it's, there's a reason it's made of water. I don't want to go too deeply into it now for lack of time, but Obviously, part of it has to do with flow and learning to stay in a flow state. Inherent in that water is 
10th dimensional love and compassion. And I know logically people are going, what are you talking about? It's just an image. It's just a thing, but I'm telling you, it actually works. I've been working with it for a long time now, teaching it all over the place. And uh, it, it is powerful. Uh, there are all kinds of ways to work with it, but we use it in our workshop as uh, parts of the meditations because it has an ability to take people to depths and to comfort and to peace and ease while we are also dealing with some challenging feelings and, and issues. So I see it as uh, uh, my, my company was originally called the Wave Energy Center for Conscious Evolution. And that's what it's here for. The wave is here to help us with our conscious evolution. Oh, um, may, I, may I say something right now? Yeah. We have uh, the responsibility to end at a certain time. But if we don't do it radically different than what we are planning in the next 11 minutes, we'll miss, we'll, we'll deprive our audience and our group with what actually one of the transition pivots is so important. So I want us to just go right into the surrender and right out into the open hearted if we can. We might not be able to get the open hearted pulled out, but I don't want to leave people hanging. So I think we should go right into surrender so that people, you demonstrate that so that we give them that depth of experience and then some way of leading into the fall, the result of that because we won't have more time for anything else. I think, I don't think we'll have time, Gary. So I think well, we need we, to skip. Why don't we drop people into at least the imagination? Okay. Okay, no. great. Well, let's go to the surrender um, music, please. Second slide. We just drop them in, and then we can receive the gratitude afterwards, even if it's a small amount. All right. So let's close our eyes and take a very deep breath. Inhaling up from the earth, exhaling down. Inhaling from above into the heart center and exhaling up and out like a fountain. Feeling the connection with the above and the below. With you as the magic conduit in the middle. And let your body sink deep down, let it get heavier than before, relaxing deeper and deeper. Imagine yourself lying in a small boat with lovely cushions to lie on, on a river. It is dusk, the sky is that beautiful twilight bloom. In the west, the sun is going down. The stars begin to emerge. As you float aimlessly, more and more relaxed. You feel that you can finally let go. Whatever has gnawed at you, whatever losses, worries, concerns, mistakes, resentments, and regrets, all come now to the surface for release. Give them to the river. The river can contain whatever you hold. Let it go, knowing you will still be you afterwards. There is no grief that can extinguish your flame. Whatever has haunted you, perhaps for your entire life, can now be brought right up to the surface. Let those memories roll up and out and give them to the river. The 
river knows all and moves things along while holding you in love. Wave after wave, old memories, unnecessary now, bubble up, finding their way through the river. And as you do this process, you feel lighter. You notice the stars beginning to poke through even more as you drift on the benevolence of the river. Here you are a simple being, a human, yet so much more. The unencumbered you glows now like a torch in the night. And a peace comes over you of simply being a part of the magnificent matrix of love, of light, of Gaia, of the entirety of creation. Now wrap yourself in an infinity wave from head to toe. Encompassing your entire being. Drink in the watery flow into every cell, renewing you, refueling you into all the nooks and crannies you just emptied out, filling them instead with love and compassion. The wave removes judgment of yourself and of others and brings a peace, knowing that all is as it should be. Now you notice your boat has begun to move downstream, knowing its destination, gently gliding through a mist. Beauty of the world is almost too much to take in. So with great gratitude for this moment, glide, boat glides bearing you brilliantly to the shore. As the moon rises to light your way, you emerge on land, unburdened, lightened, whole, and complete. I just love when you do that, Hope. It just, it, it, there's something about the way you do that and the way you marry to my music that is so beautiful. Um, this is unfair because life and healing and unraveling doesn't happen in the fast lane. And uh, in order to fully grok the pivot that we just made into the allowing ourselves to be in the river, in the immersive experience of unraveling that vicious cycle into a spiral, it sometimes requires more time. So I want to invite you all to look at uh, our you-awake.com website where we're going to be offering a two-day workshop online on August 19th. What we wanted to bring is just to the final slide. We, we wanted just to recognize a couple of things. Uh, Let me ahead. just interject one thing, Gary. There are four sections of our workshop. The first one is the brief version. The second one is forgiveness. The third is is looking into the awe. Uh, well, I won't say more about that. And the fourth one is what we're jumping to. Well, well, I want to say more about the awe because the pivot of forgiveness, which requires self-acceptance, which I personally have gone through in the last three years, you, most people, I realize most people go to their grave never having forgiven themselves, never having accepted and loved themselves fully enough to forgive themselves. I've gone through a real epiphany around that, and that's partly what's informed my love of this work. But also, when you move from forgiveness into awe of the mystery, humility cannot live in the same space as, as this kind of flow we're talking about. That humility and that reference, that relationship to awe, and then, of course, leading to the gratitude. 
being one of the highest states of human consciousness. Talk about sacred geometry for our mitochondria. Gratitude is the deal, right? Authentic gratitude. So um, if you can go to the next slide, I think we have a, do, do we have a QR code in this one or not really? But it's okay. It's, so it's the QR code is on next slide 28. Yeah. So those of you can check out Graceful Passages, which is a catalyst for resolving grief and another way of doing what Hope just touched on briefly with the, the unburdening of yourself. Graceful is a powerful catharsis catalyst that has touched over a million people. And you can go to the next slide. We have to wrap up really soon. Yeah, these are our worlds. And I think we need to go to the one that we want to talk about our workshop. So, so I want you guys to participate with us. Where is that slide? Is it coming? I don't know where it got to. All right. Well, so just if you can, you guys, we're so excited about this because one of the things I'm so excited is about, I've found a home to merge. The, the thing I've been doing for 20 years is using music as a catalyst for coherence at every scale. And I found a partner who is so phenomenally there good. Is. Yeah, there it is. The partner is so phenomenally good at actually integrating the purpose of my music with the purpose of her infinity wave to become a, a sum greater than the, a whole greater than the sum of the parts. Love to have you join us on August 19th and 20th, or your community might want us to come out to your world like we did in Virginia recently, we did a day long workshop, and then I gave a concert that night. And it, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, way to spread love and deepen your faith-based community or your deepen your culture, your corporation. We believe that this four-step method is an instrument of catalyzing the new earth as it lives in the ecology of every human being. And mm. we are committed to this as the deepest work we can do as a collaborative effort to awaken the important role that grief literacy and, as I would say, grief literacy all, you know, like uh, forgiveness literacy, all literacy and gratitude literacy, all into one thing. And that's what this is all about. I just want to, there's some sun going on here. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to thank you all. Hope final words, because we promised we'd be done and dusted five, one minute ago. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I would love people to just put their phones up to that QR code, if you wouldn't mind bringing it back. Um, and uh, because it's an opportunity to enter a, a little raffle that we are no, it's offering. Down, further down, further down. Yeah, I know that we got to And so just find that QR code for one sec. Keep down further, down further. No, the wrong direction. You, all right, there. There it is. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Just you, hold you, your you, phone up to it, and uh, and then you'll be entered in to get a session either with Gary or with me. And just remember that for this week, just imagine by the year 2030, I'd like it even sooner, where World Unity Week and the 99 Days of Peace of Unity is the most important global event on the planet because that's how I feel about it now. I adore this community. I am grateful to be part of the family. I'm so grateful, Ben and John and Irina and the team for actually inviting my sister Hope into this world, into this incredible world. Hope, uh, Ben, come and join us and let's sign off because I know you're anxious to move on to the next amazing event with Vandana Shiva and company. So um, thank you, Ben, for letting us make this topic relevant to the building of the new earth in each and every one of our hearts. That was so important. Thank you, Hope. And thank you, Gary. That you're just such pioneering and beautiful and brilliant work and such essential work as we establish the conditions for a new earth, uh, transforming our relationship to, to loss, to dying, to grief. Uh, I just uh, thought there was so much wisdom and so much brilliance in your presentation. I encourage everybody uh, to explore more your work and uh, the four pillars of your workshop. Um, just beautiful, really pioneering, beautiful, visionary, uh, gorgeous, and so compassionate work that you're putting out there on behalf of everybody. Magnificent stuff. Thank you, Hope. Thank you, Gary. Keep your eyes out for where you can find more about this and learn more about this and as establishing. Yeah, yes, Gary. And just the sacred marriage. I'm going to be doing something at uh, 4 o'clock 
let's see, 7 o'clock Eastern Time on Friday with Matthew Fox, Christian De La Huerta, Yasmin Tarehi, and uh, Shalani, uh, Shanali Rajaratam. And it's going all about this, the marriage and the necessity for the sacred marriage between the masculine and the feminine and the end of the duality into the unity. So join me for that and all of our other worlds. And Ben, I know you got, we got to go. Thank you, brother, for everything. We love you. Yeah, thank you so much.